Well, as Paul continues on in in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, he moves from focusing upon uh, those elder positions, those who are in leadership, uh, to a different level of leadership where he talks about the deacons. And the very word deacon is an interesting word because it didn't start with a church, but really was something, again, that was borrowed from the culture. And you have to realize in a world where the Greek language was really the lingua franca of the of the world at that time, even though the Romans ruled, in that part of the, of the world, and in most of the world, Greek was the most commonly spoken language. And we understand that people, as a consequence, had to be multilingual. So when we think about people like Paul in particular, we realize that he not only spoke Hebrew, he also spoke Aramaic, he spoke Latin, he spoke Greek, and he may have spoken other languages besides that. But most of the New Testament was written in the Greek language that we call the Koine or the common Greek. It was kind of of like what American is in the world. It's a common kind of English that's spoken. It's only Americanism is only one dialect of many different dialects. The most widely spoken English uh, dialect in the world is that which is found in India. Uh, because they have the largest number of people who speak English. And believe me, it's a little of a challenge sometimes to understand. Not as much a challenge as it is to understand people from New Zealand or certain parts of Australia. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, we have an American dialect that is, because of television, is pretty well understood around the world. And the same way with uh, the Greek that the New Testament was written in. And so when he talked about a deacon, deacons were basically, by definition, was somebody who waited on tables. In other words, they were a servant who uh, brought food and cared for people who were coming into the house. And in the church, they became those who were responsible for the material aspects of the ministry. So when uh, they choose the seven deacons, it's Peter who said, it's not appropriate that we should leave the word of God and prayer and wait on tables. And he was referring to the role of a deacon, not literally being a waiter in a hotel or a restaurant, but he's talking about people who care for the material aspects of the church. And so in a very real sense, many times the the board of directors of a church in our conflict are really more deacons than they are elders because their primary responsibility is the financial, the fiduciary, the monetary, uh, the asset management of a particular church. And I... Just really think it's uh, it's really important that pastors, those who are doing things that I do, kind of have a a, uh, a submissive way of looking at the people who handle the financial affairs of the church. That the pastor should not be the one who sets his salary or anybody's salary or who makes the final decisions about how monies are spent or expended. You really need to have those people who serve in that role, uh, who are often people who are skilled in the management of assets whether they be property or financial or whatever, and and not people who simply, like me, focus most of our attention on what the Word says and and how to communicate that to people in an effective way. So I'm thankful that I have people that worry about that stuff and I don't have to sit around worrying about it because in times in my past where I got caught up in that kind of stuff, it just was really a burden that was more than I could bear. So saying all that, he's talking about deacons and it's interesting, he says that these people who are put in this position have to be men worthy of respect and who are sincere who don't indulge in much wine. We've talked about that a bit and not pursuing dishonest gain. All of these things coupled together say that because they're handling the assets of a church, (coughs) excuse me, they have to be people who do so with the highest level of integrity. And that integrity is based upon a good reputation like we were talking about. Now, A good reputation, as I said yesterday, was something that we build up over a period of time, over many times, sometimes a a lifetime, where people can look at us and say that we're fair, we're honest, uh, we don't do any, we don't break our word, we keep our commitments, we do the things we say we're going to do. And I think that's so important that we understand that. And the people who are put in positions where they manage the material, the fiduciary affairs of the church, have to be people who do that as well. And you can see the issue here where they're saying the person is sincere. He isn't doing this from any kind of ulterior motive. I mean, I I hate to say it, but I know of at least one occasion we had in the history of our church where uh, somebody got into that role and they turned out to be a dishonest person who was 
literally trying to use their role in the in the uh, uh, board of directors to enrich themselves in an illegal way. And and um, we had to, when I found that out and it was discovered and we exposed it, um, it was a very painful thing. But the bottom line was the guy was a crook, a thief, and a liar and uh, had fooled many of us, fortunately, without losing any money. But at the point is, it just you realize that there are people who are insincere, who will even look at the church and other Christians as being subtle prey. And uh, let me go out here, walk on some thin ice and say this, because one of the things that has, has bothered me a lot is that many people say, well, when I'm dealing with any kind of financial issue in my life, I want to work only with Christians. And I think that that should be something we say has no, no threat to it. But I often get concerned when you talk about things like multi-marketing promotions where the people are trying to build this financial pyramid and get you to be part of their team. And so you're purchasing the, the product that they're promoting so that the rewards go up and they begin to become financially benefited as a result from it. Um, and I just think that, and I'm not saying those things are always wrong. I'm just saying uh, you shouldn't see people in the church as being your prospects. I think most of us, who, especially if you've lived as long as I have, know those times when we were invited over to somebody's house and we thought it was going to be a time of fellowship and we found it became a promotion to sign up from some uh, marketing program that they had. <clears throat> Again, I don't want to say that they're always wrong. I just know that uh, oftentimes that has destroyed a lot of friendships. And we should never look at our fellow brothers and sisters as a key to making money. Uh, when I was a kid, I on my way out the door, my dad, uh, when I would go to church with my friends, he would give me a dollar bill because in those days a dollar was worth something. And he said, put that in the plate for me. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, it, it looks good for business. In other words, he wanted his son to be in the church and people know I was his son. They'd see me throwing a dollar in the plate. And he thought somehow that would be a recommendation to do business with him. I'm not sure it ever was. Um, I think that all they had to do is be around me for a few minutes and realize they probably didn't want to have anything to do with him. But the point was, this is, uh, you know, insincerity. Somebody once said, sincerity is the key thing. Once you learn how to fake that, you've got it made. And we live in an age where a lot of people pretend to be very sincere. I, I know the difference myself. I see people who do things for others, not because it's a, somehow going to advantage them, but rather because it's going to cost them. And they're doing it out of a desire to bless this other person. And so uh, I would just simply say that you want to be men who are worthy of respect because you have this track record of being someone who sincerely cares for the welfare of others above and beyond yourself. In fact, I even think about this when I, uh, when my wife and I go to a restaurant, I always try to tip people generously. Uh, and I do so because I know that they're not getting paid well. <clears throat> and besides, I've had many non-Christians tell me that uh, many times Christians can be the worst tippers in the world, especially for some reason in our, our community. I don't know. Um, like, it's like we got a lot of blue collar people who don't believe that tipping should happen. But those people are serving me. That's some of their primary income. And I really encourage people to be sensitive to that. They've served you and they're not getting a, a commensurate paycheck from their employer. If you're in Europe, it's a whole different story, but over here they don't. And uh, it's really important, I think, to treat them fairly. And that's one of the things I always always think about, because even when we've had work on our home, I remember one guy who did some work for us and he did such a phenomenal job. And the price he was charging us, I felt was too low for the quality of work he did. And I, I gave him a significantly, I paid him far more <laughs> than he was asking because I felt like he deserved it. And uh, it's not like I'm rich and I can do that all the time, but I just couldn't take advantage of him in that way. I felt like that's what was happening, was that he was doing the work and he was going to end up coming out in the short end of the stick. And I didn't want that to happen. And so I think it's really, really important that we keep those kind of things in focus. Well, I see I've kind of rambled on here and gone in some different directions, but I hope you... Um, I hope these things are, are helpful. Um, there are things that I think that matter a lot and they'll give you more joy and reward in your life as time goes on. The idea of being men with good re reputation, men who have men and women who are worthy of being respected of others because uh, they're good people 
And at the end of the day, people may not always agree with you. They may not have the same point of view. But you do want them to say, but, you know, they didn't treat me wrongly. They weren't unfair to me. They were honest. Anyway, God bless you, and we'll pick it up next week as we continue these conversations. In Jesus' name, amen.